Thank you. So I'm, I'm uh, much more on the practical side, so you, don't, you won't see any proofs. Um, I wish I could do some proofs, but um, it's, it's a little hard. So um, yeah, no, if you tell me how, I will. Um, so the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, so this talk is basically motivating something. And then also, uh, we'll talk about a data set. And um, I have to kind of ask you to not talk to a lot of people about this, especially not the press right now, because there's going to be an official press release soon. And before we have that, please do not talk about it to the press. Um, um, what we are doing, um, and then also, um, um, yeah, basically what we're doing, and, and also, and it's more important and more interesting for you, I think, what we want to do, right? So because we don't know how to do it. <laughs> so um, here's what happens. Most people think um, the internet is all about email and all about, uh, you know, web pages, which is kind of true, um, but then that's not where the chunk of data is. So the chunk of data is you have uh, basically most of the internet is video. So what is interesting about it, the perception is so skewed that most, that even the people who actually did this graph didn't really understand it. So um, I took this graph, uh, which is basically, I think, uh, May, no, September 2013. Um, and they said um, that Netflix and YouTube are America's biggest traffic hogs. Okay, fine. Um, the other news was actually video is half the internet. Let me show you it's not half. <laughs> uh, so what they do is they put routers on like the, in North America and then they just basically uh, do traffic analysis and, and try to do um, based on what the packets have, right? So you see where the packets are coming from and to. But then also, I mean, the point is here, Netflix, YouTube is 50%, true. But then you have this big thing, which is uh, other MPEG, by the way. That's definitely video, right? Um, iTunes is definitely video. Amazon, I can tell you, that's not book sales. Um, uh, Hulu is definitely video. Um, what we, who knows what happens inside an SSL encrypted stream. Um, and then um, HTTP traffic, uh, I would be very surprised um, if, let's keep it to 10, it's fine. And then BitTorrent, I mean, we don't exchange email or HTTP traffic through BitTorrent, so it's most likely also video. But then, even if you disregard those, there's this big other category, <laughs> right? And you could just think about what that will be, um, because, um, <laughs> right. <laughs> That's what it is. Oh. And it's definitely video. <laughs> so, another statistics. YouTube alone claims uh, yeah, and that was funny because that slide I put on it over a couple of years, three years ago when I put this on, it claimed 48 hours upload every minute. Um, last year it was 72 hours upload every minute, and this year it's 100 hours of upload every minute. Every minute, right? That means uh, I'm talking and another 100 hours, another 100 hours, another 100 hours. And, uh, you know, YouTube is just one of the many, so UQ is a Chinese YouTube clone. Uh, you know, it's basically lots of people in China who upload there. And then, of course, we have Flickr, Instagram, LifeLeak, Vimeo, all these other sites as well. And, you know, again, uh, Netflix store stuff, but it's, it's mostly commercial. So the question is, why do we care, right? Of course, you know, do we really care about Gangnam Style or Miley Cyrus um, as researchers? Not so much. But the problem is... Um, that basically what we can search for on these portals is orthogonal to what we care about as researchers. Um, so basically what happens here is that in theory, these consumer produced videos should allow empirical studies at never before seen scale, right? Um, in pretty much any empirical research discipline, in industry, in, in anything you can think of because these videos are snapshots of people's life, and if you could just search for them adequately, you could do a lot of stuff. Um, and what's interesting about videos versus text is that videos convey information in the background. So, and I will have examples about this, but most often when videos are uploaded, it says, my Paris trip, fine. That's that's what you can search for. But in reality, it conveys all this information about which car drove when in Paris, or, or you know, what was the weather in Paris at the point, 
right? Uh, what was this, you know, building like, or what just happened in the background there? So all this stuff is in there, even though all the annotation we find is my trip in Paris. Um, and we did some research just to give you an idea um, of what can you do, what you, what you do with this background information. We said, okay, the most interesting background information and the most accessible one is geolocation. So what happens is about three to six percent of internet videos are geolocated with sensor data. So what happens is cameras have GPS and they will put in the, uh, the GPS coordinates of videos into the videos. The question for us was, wow, that's great. Three to six percent of the internet, that's big data, right? So why don't we take a lot of these videos, and back then we took about 15,000 uh, to train classifiers to find out uh, where the other 94% of videos are that don't have GPS sensor tags. And guess what? The accuracy we achieved was beyond what we could ever believe. So we have an evaluation that's now going on yearly, every year. And in last media eval 2012, um, we managed to classify 15% of 5,000 random Flickr videos within 10 meter accuracy. That is the accuracy of the GPS because it's why one and 10 is the same. Um, but and also, if you go a little higher, we managed to classify about 40% uh, um, of them in a 100 kilometer range or way over 50 in a 1,000 kilometer range, which means which country is a video from is a high, high accuracy already. And so how do we do this? Well, the funny thing is that um, it's background information, right? So nobody encoded. So if you see the Eiffel Tower, fine. Then it's the Eiffel Tower. But trust me, not 50% of the videos show you, you know, something that is like as, as salient as this. So what it is is classifiers, you know, trained on enough data will pick stuff up that humans don't even pick up and then automatically find these things. And this is just one example of what you can do in the background with this background information. But what we really want to do is we want to make videos searchable beyond keyword tags. We, we want to search for anything that's kind of any mental concept we came up with. That's, you know, the long, long, long-term goal. Um, and basically the question is for us, how do we make this large-scale concept search possible, right? So here's, here's one search. Um, um, that I want, actually, I will show you later. Um, uh, here's one typical search that could save us a lot of work. Um, one is, uh, so if you want to do a study like, let's say, how babies catch a ball, right? Um, what you do right now is you write a 100-pager or so IRB proposal to work with these very fragile subjects. <laughs> Then you go to the infant cognition lab, you give them some money, they will poll 100 parents or maybe 200 parents, and then all these babies will try to catch a ball, even though maybe 100 parents will show up, 50 babies will cooperate, and in the end, after two or three years of work, you have maybe 50 videos of babies trying to catch a ball, and so now, based on these 50 videos, you can do your research. In theory, if you did a YouTube search for babies catching a ball, you should find millions. In practice, if you do the YouTube search, you pretty much find those 50. Um, it's already better, <laughs> but um, given the upload rate of especially you know, kids' videos, um, there should be millions. So the concept here to search for would be baby catching a ball. And this is gonna be, uh, go, go through, um, um, basically, this is the task, video concept search. Basically, given a set of concepts described uh, so, so the way we do this right now, and this is the more the practical, uh, the practical way this is done, is we search for videos in YouTube and find those 50, and then given those 50, we train a model and hope that this model is good enough to find more than this 50, right? Um, and this has been done, it's called uh, TrackVid MED. Um, this has been done since now, 2011. And the government started this, and so they gave us concepts what to search for, including like attempting a bike trick, cleaning an appliance, stuff like this. And also, I want to show you that this is not a joke in the sense that it's really, really, they want to do very accurate. So here's some example videos. Um, so one is war trick. Right. 
Yeah, so this, yeah. This is punishment for this video, right? So <laughs> this video goes on for half an hour. We don't watch the video for half an hour. This is also a board trick. <laughs> right? And what about this one? <laughs> yeah, so that's a negative because nobody tried a trick. It's just trying somebody trying to do a board thing. Right? So that's the accuracy we were looking for. Um, and in fact, this, the whole concept detection thing was started because it was a complexity sweet spot. You know, finding objects or finding Miley Cyrus uh, is something Google can do really well. But finding something that's a little more complex than object, um, and I say Google because I say state of the art, right? But the point is something that's a little bit more, it was a complexity sweet spot. So basically, if you search for something that what linguists were very interested in, like people giving directions, there were zero results in, in any of the video search engines that we tried. Uh, by now, there are some because they learn to, but in any way, there were zero results, and we had results. So we were already beating them um, in a much smaller subset. And the way to think about it is it's kind of like a telescope. Find more uh, based on what can easily be served, but it's still far from all. It's basically like looking at the stars, you find more of them. And so this is how an interface looks like, uh, something we, we started doing. Basically, you have uh, a text search on the left, and then you, do, uh, uh, you find some videos, and the user says, yeah, these are the ones, boom, 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 and then you go in, and it researches, and you iterate this a couple of times, and you find more and more and more and more videos. So very practical. So now we get to the point, though, where all of this seemed very toy for us, um, because, again, YouTube claims 100 hours per minute. How can we actually ramp our research up to be like at least um, much closer to the scale that we're talking about. And this is something, again, don't uh, shout it out yet. It's going to be shout out anyway. Um, we have been working with Flickr videos in the past. And um, you know, again, this is going to be announced uh, by Yahoo and Flickr in more detail. But basically, we're going to get a huge, huge data set. And these numbers aren't even correct. Um, a huge, huge data set from them. We're already preparing it to basically have features collected, have all of this done. And that already, just the feature extraction takes a long time. Um, and we're doing this together with Lawrence Livermore Lab because they have much better compute than we at XE. <laughs> and in fact, I'm going to show you about this compute architecture. But we're already hitting boundaries in sort of the initial stages of feature computation on a data set like this. Basically, the estimated size of the data is going to be around 50 terabytes. Um, so big data. Um, and, um, and this data set is already being used and will, is already sort of announced for s some of the challenges where it's going to be done. And say release date June, because yeah, we are working on it right now. It's going to be July, though. Um, um, so the, the, the question, though, is so now we have all this data. And what's interesting about this is it allows for completely different approaches than have we done before. So in computer vision, the typical idea is that you have to do like segmentation, object detection, sort of you go bottom up. And we say, no, what we want to do, and what we started with smaller data, and now that we have large data, what we want to do is we want to go top down. So whenever I work with big data, um, <laughs> my, I tell my people to don't use your brain. Um, it's kind of counterintuitive in a university or in a research setting to say don't use your brain, right? But what it actually means is use your brain in the right way and don't think that the computer thinks like a human, right? Whenever we tried to do something where the computer was kind of like emulating what the human did, we had a problem. <laughs> but when we just basically went with the data flow, it worked much better. And so basically, the idea here is instead of finding out how a video would be described where a baby catches a ball, of course, we all have ideas how a baby would catch a ball. We will the idea is, given that amount of data now, we can start to have the computer figure out how a typical video looks like where babies catch a ball. And we decided to do this um, by hand um, on a baby catch a ball video, and actually some of them. And what's interesting here is, first of all, Cameron learns to catch. 
right? Your search query would have been baby catching a ball or trying to catch a ball. None of this would have matched, you know, just typical example. Um, so we found this video anyways. But the interesting thing is, um, if you also look, there's two tracks, right? Videos contain visual information as well as acoustic information. That's the other thing. So if you go ahead and say, uh, let's try to do all the computer vision to model, you know, the, the, the baby trying to catch a ball, is kind of difficult. And in fact, this is what you should be doing after you found all these videos. Um, but what we found out is there's actually something very specific in the audio track, and that's this ball sound. Unfortunately, the ball sound only appears like maybe for 1% of the entire audio track, and it's overlapped with other stuff, and including room-specific noise, right? So what we want is we want the computer to figure out exactly this 1% that makes the video distinctive. But given enough data, and that's our assumption, it should be doable, right? So I'm giving you, I'm, I don't have a terrible lot of time, but I'm giving you an idea of how we do this currently. Um, so what we do is we extract what we call audible units, or I call them percepts, after Immanuel Kant who had the idea of percepts and concepts. So concepts is anything you can think about. A percept is anything you can perceive. And then the problem is the mapping between the two. So a percept for us, in, in this computer audio domain is only basically audio that is similar enough that a human would say, um, and yeah, now we have the human back in the equation, that a human would say it sort of sounds the same without knowing what it is. So a chainsaw engine will sound the same as a mown lower engine as maybe you know a small motorbike. It's still an engine, but it's different concepts, right? But it's still the same percepts, just to give you an idea. Um, and so the idea is that what we do is we take those videos, maybe baby catching a ball, and we want to find out, given all these similarities, which, which are the percepts, which are the sort of, uh, you know, some people call them visual words, or we would call them acoustic words. Um, what of these, which of these percepts are common across all the videos that's, that show baby catching a ball, but uncommon across anything else, right? Um, and this is basically how it works. Um, so the way we do this is we have a, a step that tries to do similarity detection on audio. Um, and then we do TF-IDF, which is a common retrieval uh, technique, which is basically doing exactly um, common across versus un uh, uncommon across versus common inside the class. And then we try an SVM on, on, on those scores. And then. Um, yeah, so this will be going into the details of the algorithm, which I invite you to basically ask me or I can send you papers. But what's, uh, what's interesting is um, that once we did this percepts extraction, is we ended up with something that looked like this, a long tail distribution. And in fact, the more, the, the better we did it, it, it was more and more Ziphian. Um, so not a surprise, yet great. Um, because the next thing we did, we looked at those percepts on the left and we looked at them in the long tail and we find out that it actually behaves like language in the sense that on the left you have stuff that is so common across everything that you can discard it. On the right you have stuff you'll never find anyway. But in the middle you have stuff that's actually often very specific to specific videos and unspecific to other videos. And that's why we could use um, TFIDF. Uh, because that's basically how language behaves. You have all these words that are so common, they don't do anything, or you have all these words that you never find. But in the middle is the stuff that you care about. Um, so also we took a look at how these percepts look like. Um, and this is basically, you know, this would be working on a wood project. And it's kind of funny because, again, we extracted the audio percepts, and this is now visual information. Um, then we have acoustic uh, then we have landing a fish, which is kind of like exactly landing a fish. And then also we have uh, feeding an animal, which is exactly feeding an animal. Um, so um, we use all kinds of other methods too, like deep learning and so on. Um, so the problem here is that we have is the algorithms work better the larger the scope of the data. Um, um, and 
Other thing is we have data chunks usually that are dependent on each other and have varying length. Um, and really the funny thing is the only way to do this right now is to give one CPU one video, right? Because we don't really know how to parallelize stuff inside a video because it's all depending on each other and that dependency might be the interesting one. And even if you do one video per node, which is what we do right now, we run into a communication bottleneck because Twitter is like, maybe text information is maybe, you know, 100 characters, but a video uncompressed is gigabytes. So we use, at Lawrence Livermore, uh, what they call Catalyst. It's a Cray CS300, which is optimized for video processing. And that Cray is basically um, trying to uh, help us by putting NVRAM to every CPU. So here's what happened in the past. In the past, what happened is we send all these videos to different CPUs, and they do all these processing steps. But then we have all these results coming back to one central hard disk, and that's what doesn't work, right? So now instead of doing that, we'll have intermediate results go directly to an NVRAM connected to each CPU, and then only end results go to a central hard disk. Um, that helped a little bit. But still, the, the major thing is what you really want to do is you don't want to do one video per, uh, per node. What you really want to do is you want to take all these videos from baby catching a ball and look at them globally. And I have no idea how to do that. So here we are. What do we actually want to do? <laughs> right? What we want to do is you know, the most simple stuff, honestly. <laughs> right? So just do some statistical analysis. Get us somewhere where we can understand more of the data. So why can't we just go ahead, take a bunch of videos, let's say 100, right? And cluster the videos all together, and then just do a PCA, see you know, what's the biggest thing, right? Um, or, or ICA, SVD, on, you know, in all dimensions. It's like, it's just impossible right now. And then uh, also, it would be cool to actually try one of these deep learning techniques. But then again, <laughs> on 50 terabytes, it's a little hard. Um, and in general, we want basically anything machine learning scalable to nearest neighbors. I mean, we are so in the beginning at this point um, that the only thing we actually have is nearest neighbors. <laughs> um, and um, what I described here, um, the, the algorithms that we use that sort of worked, that need more data, um, they're a combination of many machine learning techniques. But the point is that they only worked on like, you know, 10,000 of videos. And they may work on hundreds of thousands of videos, but they don't work on millions at all because we're not scalable beyond that point. Um, and uh, yeah, that's where we are. And it's kind of a little cry for help <laughs> because uh, I'm, I'm open to any ideas, any questions. Uh, let me know. Yes. So I think the question was <laughs> um, that um, how much human involvement is done in the interface? I mean, are, are humans going to go through hundreds of videos and say, yes, 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 no, 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 yes, yes, yes? Or the outputs. Oh, the outputs. Yes. So this is a good question um, because we had, didn't have that problem yet. The reality is that we don't find enough, right? Um, I wish we f found enough that we have this problem. And you're right, we would have this problem if once we get better. Um, and um, uh, as for, for general annotation to do the research, yes, we, we have corpora that have this annotation for these concepts. And we also uh, create more annotation for the new corpus. Uh, we're basically working on this right now. But in, in reality, yeah, for the search interface, it's more like you find a couple and then you're really glad you find some. It's more like, so people should know the, the accuracy of video search is way below like 0.00001% or something. Because basically, you know, it's, it's, I mean, people don't see this, right? So Google or, or yeah, the, the search engines do a really good job in hiding this. And I had this often students come to me and say, but video search works, right? I put in, I put in keywords and then all the videos I find have keywords. And here's the fallacy. Yes, all the videos you find have keywords. That's all the videos you find, by the way. Uh, there's 90 or something percent that doesn't have, you don't have anything because people are just on annotating. And also, if, even if they're annotating, they're annotating the video with a very 
with this thing in mind when they upload it and not what you might be searching it for, right? So they might be uploading the video with, um, you know, a certain camera on, um, uh, you know, learns to catch, and that's even nice. But then again, what if you use the same video just to figure out what kind of TVs have people, uh, do people have at home uh, in 2014, right? This is what you can do with consumer-produced videos, but then again, there's no way you can do this with text search. Oh, the question was, can you learn multiple concepts from a video? Uh, we try to not do this right now because we're already, we're still busy with trying to figure out how to do one. But the, the, the theoretical answer would be yes, right? 